Boom. Okay, we are recording. Okay, so Lauren, would you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell the people about who you are, what you do. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren McGoodwin. I'm the founder and CEO of Career Contessa. We are a career site built inclusively for women, and we are a career site, not a job site. And the reason why that's important is because, yes, we have a jobs board. Yes, we can help you find a new job, but we are really a one-stop shop slash resource for all your career needs in every career stage. So um, whether you are trying to figure out your next career move, whether you're actively job searching or maybe passively job searching, maybe you're in a job that you really love and you're trying to navigate the ins and outs of how do you grow in this career? How do you become a leader or you are a leader and how do you do all the things? So um, that's really our goal at Career Contessa is to be a career resource for women. Um, if you go to careercontessa.com, you can basically see from the top navigation bar, all the things that we offer. But a lot of the stuff that we do is free or ex extremely low cost. Um, so it, I always joke that like, it's kind of a la carte. It's like going to a buffet and then you can pick what you want um, for every lear different learning style. We've got a podcast, videos, written articles, um, our downloadable resources. We have digital events. Um, and then if you kind of keep moving up the food chain, you can get to um, some of the paid resources, such as um, we have a career coaching marketplace. So we pre-vet all of the career coaches that are on there that can work with you one-on-one. We have online learning courses. Most recently, I came out with my book, which is called Power Moves. Yeah, I got the sweater and everything. Um, how Women Can Pivot, Reboot, and Build a Career of Purpose, which um, was something I'd been working on for the last two years. And, and the goal of the book is to help women learn how to pay, make power moves in their career, which are these intentional, intentional actions and moves that help you build a career that is not just successful, but also fulfilling. So I am really excited to be here. I love meshing the world of finance and career together because so much of that does mesh together. Um, so yeah, that's that's Career Contessa and I guess me in a nutshell. I, I should mention just a little background stuff on me too. I was a recruiter at Hulu prior to launching Career Contessa. That was kind of where I got the, the recruiting uh, kick of all the things job search, but also I was working for a tech company and there were no female leaders. So that was kind of back in those days. Um, and before, that I was working as an admin assistant for a dental school. So I know what it's like to be looking for a job in a recession. I know what it's like to take a job that you don't love. I know what it's like to make that tough career transition. And luckily, I also know what it's like to be on the other side of that, having been in a career that was a really good fit with a great company. So I, um, you know, I, I really am very passionate about helping other women kind of figure out and navigate those career transitions because they are happening all the time to us. Oh my gosh, I could not agree more. <laughs> As someone who graduated in 2011, kind of right at the, the I like to call it the aftermath of yeah. the 08 recession. And, yeah. you know, I waited tables for my first three years out of college because I just could not find a quote unquote real job. So yep. ooh, I love it. I love someone who's been kind of on both sides of things. So, okay. So Speaking of kind of being on both sides of things, when you got the idea for Career Contessa and you were beginning to kind of make moves for yourself, in your first year, let's say, what do you think were some of the most impactful things you did for the business's growth and for the business's finances, like the profitability? Yeah. <laughs> profitability. Yeah. Well, profit and revenue is something I'm still learning that relationship with. <laughs> so I'll back up a little bit. Um, so I, so I'd been working in, as an admin assistant for a dental school, which was inside of a major university. And here's a, a hot money tip for everybody that at least if you, at this university, they would pay for your graduate school programming. So I enrolled in a master's program while I was working there because one, I was bored. I had nothing to do, but two, they would also pay for it. So I was working on getting my master's in communication management. And I think I was like two semesters shy of graduating when I got my job at Hulu. And part of graduation is you have to write a thesis on something. and so. I picked to write on millennial women and career resources. I've, I've been obsessed with this topic for a very long time. I think that's what happens when you graduate and you kind of fall flat on your face when your expectations are very different than that. So I was writing my thesis on this. I was working at Hulu, so I was now on the other side of the hiring table. And as part of my thesis statement, Career Contessa was the prototype. I fell into this weird kind of loophole for some grant money, and I used that grant money to create the very first prototype. 
originally my creation of Career Contessa was just to prove that, you know, the career resources that exist out there really didn't speak to women and they didn't speak to certainly this next generation that was going to be really taking over the workforce in, in, a, in, a, in numbers that we've never, ever experienced before. I kept Career Contessa as a side hustle for about a year and a half before I left Hulu to work on it full time um, because I thought I was going to leverage it into another job. I um, was traveling a lot with other tech people. And I remember talking to, um, one of the developers and he was like, what are you going to do next? And I was like, um, I don't know, maybe I'll be a product manager or something like that. And he's like, well, you're definitely going to need a website or something. So I, I kept it because I was like, oh, this is my ticket to something, you know, bigger job wise. But through that year and a half, I would do the thing. I think like a lot of people with side hustles, I didn't necessarily start career contested to make money. So I didn't have this business model all planned out. I would, you know, carve out time in the mornings and the evenings to work on it. When I first started Career Contessa, it was just our interview series. So I was interviewing women about what do you do and how did you get there? Um, and then slapping it up on a blog post. It was when I started to really, I think like lean in had come out and there was some other stuff starting to come out about like just women in the workplace. And I was like, see, I'm not crazy. Like it is different for us. Um, and again, being on the other side of the hiring table, I was learning so much. So that was when I started to think, I wonder if what I'm going to do next is, is this. Um, so my first year and a half was a side hustle. I got to save a lot of money. I got to kind of prepare. So that is definitely, I think a, a huge, um, piece, piece of advice for people who are thinking about starting a business. You don't have to jump off the cliff. You can dip your toe into the pool and like slowly move into it. I think that for my personality type, that was, that worked best. Um, and then my first year of working full time at career Contessa was a complete, I hope I can curse, but shit show. Like it mm -hmm. was, it was all over the place. I, I really realize now in hindsight that I didn't do my due diligence to understand how am I going to make money? Um, what is my business model? Um, I kind of eventually, I would say six months after wasting time, you know, chasing this, chasing that, chasing this. Um, thank God I had some savings, by the way, I also like would walk neighborhood dogs just to have some cash. I mean, like it was very scrappy. Um, I finally kind of settled on like, okay, media or content blogging. And so that was where I started to expand to talk about topics other than just the interviews that led me to get our first sponsored content deal with Squarespace. Um, and it was enough money that I was like, okay, well I won't pay myself, but I'll get an employee and I will hire them and they will help me grow the business that at least that was my thought process. Again, in hindsight, I would definitely not recommend entrepreneurs do the thing where they don't pay themselves for a year. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, that's not a business. That's just kind of like robbing from Paul to pay Peter kind of thing. And so I, um, I learned a lot, <laughs> obviously. Um, so that was where I think the first introduction into like, how are you going to make money? What profit versus revenue, what that looks like. And, and, and I'm not, like I said, I mean, I still have these conversations with myself. I, I made a big mistake in 2019 where I was like, oh, we can double our revenue. And I thought, oh, that will naturally double profits. And it, it, it doesn't, unfortunately, the math doesn't work quite like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so I can, re I personally can relate to so much of what you just said, mostly that, yeah, Bravely Go was a side hustle for me. Or actually, I was trying to do it full time, but I kept a side hustle while I was trying to get it started. Yes. And I'm totally self funded. And man, those, that first year, that first two years, honestly, the hustle, the scrappiness, yeah. <laughs> the frantically Googling things to figure yes. out. <laughs> yeah. Everything is figured out via a Google search, yes. watching something, podcast. Yeah. It's all self taught. Yeah. And I think that's so important for people to hear because it's so easy to see the picture perfect Instagram account or like you're interviewed in, I remember the first time I was interviewed and featured in Forbes and everyone was like, you've made it. And I was yeah. Like, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> like this doesn't necessarily translate into revenue or into profit. And that's what yeah. keeps the lights on. <laughs> so. Yeah. I have a phrase, I use it a lot at Career Contessa called glitter and glue. And like, mm. I'm like, the glitter is, you know, the Forbes interview. It's being able to go to a lunch with a friend at like 
one o'clock on a Tuesday because you have a flexible schedule. Like those are all glitter things, right? But glue is what keeps a company together. It's the, it, the glue is what holds you together. And I really do believe that you need to have a mix of glitter and glue, whether it's your content, whether it's your PR, whether it's like whatever it is. And, um, you know, un unfortunately the glitter is the stuff that people are always like giving you the compliments on, you know, mm -hmm. they're always like, Oh, you've made it. Cause you were in Forbes and you're like, yeah, but you didn't see like the six months where I was scrappy and staying up at night and trying to teach myself how to code or how to edit a video or something that was like very not glamorous, you know? Right. Yeah. I think I completely agree. And I think that's so, thank you for sharing. I think that's just so important for everyone here to know, like there's a lot of glitter. You can see the glitter really easily, but the glue yeah. is behind the scenes. So Man, we are living in some wild times. <laughs> yes. yes, we are. <laughs> a grab bag of a year for sure. And I think right now in this specific moment, things can feel especially heavy. You know, I'm having a lot of conversations in my personal life and in my professional life about how do we address, you know, a lot of what's happening, a pandemic, racial justice, our own business practices. So yeah. how are you handling that at career contessa and what do you think the role of a, a business leader is in this kind of moment yeah i mean i think these are the moments where you really see leaders either rise to the top because they they have it in them or they kind of just like disintegrate and they're like i can't do it they handle everything just like every time they're given the opportunity to do it right they kind of do it wrong like i do mm -hmm. feel like this is like that moment where those true leaders do come out because some of this is intuition and gut. Some of this is just like, like racial injustice is like, this is not, it's not a political thing. This is, this is a human thing. Right. So like, at the end of the day, leaders being human, showing your vulnerabilities, admitting mistakes, being humble. I mean, I know with my team, I've had to say like, I don't, I don't know the answer to this. Like, I don't, I don't have a strategy for that. I don't have a game plan for that. Um, I don't know that, you know, again, like admitting you don't know, um, I think this is also a time of like a lot of self-awareness as leaders to recognize that also you are a leader. And so it is your job to step up to the plate and provide some answers. Sometimes the answer is that you guys, I, I don't know though. And, and, and let me come back. Let me, we'll, we'll figure this out. So you know, I, I think that we are living in a really wild time. Um, I know at Career Contessa, we are not immune to coronavirus and, and it's, it's wrath. You know, we, um, about a third of our revenue is made through brand partnerships and those just sort of were indefinitely put on hold, which is you never want to hear and definitely put on hold for a revenue stream. Um, and so that's really required me and my team to, um, pivot and get creative and, you know, these, and also you, while you're pivoting, you don't know if that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't know if that's going to work. And so, um, and I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, I just feel like it's, this is that time where, um, again, leaders, kind of rise to the occasion. And that doesn't mean that you're going to get everything right. I think it's a matter of how you're going to deal with it. It's like not asking people, how are you doing at the beginning of coronavirus? You know, like, how are you feeling? It's, it's saying, Hey, this is all really heavy. I don't expect you to work eight hours every single day. Um, because I think right now it's important that you take care of your mental health, right? It's, um, addressing the racial injustice that's happening and having an open dialogue conversation with um, people at your team about how you can listen and learn and do better like these are um again like i i think a lot of this comes down to sort of like this is a human uh, that needs to approach this with like a human outlook not like you know there's no pr team that's gonna like write your statements for you for every single thing you can possibly do as a leader Yes. Oh, I love that. I literally wrote down, you know, sometimes the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Let me figure this out. Because you're right. None of us are born with a perfect business script. And it's not like, oh, when you get your LLC or your S Corp, here's the book that shows you every single yeah. problematic situation you may run into and how to handle it. We're all just people bringing our own experiences yeah. and kind of rolling with the punches. So I really appreciate yeah. that. 
Yeah. It's been interesting to see too. Like we've had revenue streams that I won't say like we ignored them, but we didn't prioritize them. And now they're like, for example, we've always done webinars, but there was a time where I was like, maybe we should get rid of the webinars. And like mm-hmm. now, of course, with coronavirus, like they're, they're so important to have and to be offering that. And so it's also interesting, like how when you have multiple revenue streams, I think that's really important for a business. I don't think you ever want to put all your eggs in one basket because the, the weight of all those baskets, it's going to fluctuate. Um, and you might want to invest heavily in this area at a certain point in your business's, um, lifetime, um, to help prepare for a future. And I think that's going to be something that a lot of people come out of this is recognizing like, cash flow is super important and the people who have cash flow and the people who have not been playing this like you know crazy wild chicken and egg game where it's like you know i think that's going to be for the people who make it out of this kind of thing it's like that will be certainly prioritized i completely agree i've had a lot of conversations with my small business owner friends about an emergency fund for your business, business savings, business capital. And it's very different from conversations I was having, you know, nine months ago when it was more so like, I'm all in for growth. Right. Um, So uh, kind of along that note, like what do you think does not get talked about enough when it comes to business finances? I mean, I feel like, like we were talking about earlier, a lot of people skip over the difference between profit and revenue and they're very different things. And honestly, a lot of businesses are not profitable. Like I think Twitter might still not even be profitable. It definitely wasn't last year. Um, But like, what else do you think, especially, you know, to your point earlier of being a woman in often many male dominated areas, like what do you think doesn't get talked about enough? I mean, certainly I think the profit over revenue, I think that doesn't get talked about, but also like, um, I remember I was at this conference once and the way they introduced people where they were like, oh yeah, she's a VC funded, yada, yada. She's a VC funded, yada, yada, or that's her investor. And it was like, so all of us who are self-funded, we're just chop liver over here, mm-hmm. right? Like we just don't matter because we didn't convince a bunch of people to give us money off of an idea. We actually went out and created it and that somehow created, that's worth less. Like, I think that's something where I, I think that people really glamorize and like from a status perspective, it's like, oh, you're VC funded. So therefore your business is more worthy of someone's time or to be on those conference circuits or whatever like that. And it's like, you know, what's actually really amazing is to be able to build a business that is profitable, truly profitable and sustainable. And maybe you don't have a team of 25 and some sexy office that's an architectural digest, but guess what? Like, look what's happening to some of those companies. They're Mm -hmm. all, it was just a facade anyways. So I found for myself, like not having those expectations on yourself, but also like, I think there is, we need our society to also value like the small business owner who is, you know, has, um, I don't know, like the dry cleaner and the person who has, um, a coffee shop and the person who is doing stuff where it's like, look, it it might not be sexy and glamorous to you, but that's a profitable business and they're making it. And, you know, can you say the same or do you need to keep fundraising in order to, to make your dollar? So I, I, I just, I feel like I, at least some of the challenges I've come up against with career Contessa is like, we've never been this like big name that's like sexy and glamorous and people like, cause you know, it's like BC fun and some celebrity essence. And I don't know. I, I think that that's something that isn't talked enough about in business is just sort of um, like people seem to almost always like make that sound like that's not enough. And it's like, Oh no, I think that's actually more, more than what some of these other places are doing. So that's a big one, but yeah, I, I mean, not to kind of um, beat the dead horse, but like the profit revenue thing is, is really big. Um, and some other things that are not talked about. Oh, I mean, on that line a little bit, there's a lot of people that are willing to tell you how much like, oh, I had a seven figure launch or we're a multi six figure, uh, you know, revenue business. But I mean, they, that doesn't tell the whole story. They might not have a scalable business and that revenue stream might be coming from a place that they got once and it's not continuous too. Oh my gosh, that I love that you said that because that's probably my number one 
annoyance and like kind of the small business world where people are like, I had a six figure launch or we did whatever, whatever. And they don't tell you how much they spent on advertising. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, and how much did you spend on those Facebook ads? You know, like how, yeah. again, how much did you actually take home from that launch? Which a lot, no one ever tells you. <laughs> no, they, they don't. I would say the same thing for like email lists. They'll be like, oh, we have 500,000 people on our email list. I'm like, that you built with giveaways to trips to Paris or something mm -hmm. like that, you know? So there's a lot of like posturing that happens around numbers. Um, especially I think it's like, I don't think it's just small businesses. I just think it's like businesses in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Oh man. Now I'm all like fired up about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, but I mean, like, I do think career Contessa, like for all that people are no maybe ignoring you at the VC table, <laughs> but like you've had really incredible success and you've obviously worked really hard and you've got a gift for running a business. And I think that's really exciting. Um, but I think like we live in a world, especially the business world of success gets so wrapped up in like money or how many celebrities use your product <laughs> or something like that. I think it's an ever moving target. And I know myself, like I felt successful, like, the first time I got hired as a, like as a freelance writer to talk about money, I was like, oh my God, someone wants me. They want my voice. Amazing. And then I felt successful again. The first time I was a panelist on, on an NPR show and I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. What are some milestones that you've hit that have made you feel successful? Yeah, oh, that's fun. Um, so one in particular, I... I remember I was in New York for, um, a conference or something. And, um, I remember I was desperately trying to meet with Rebecca Jarvis who has a podcast and she's an ABC news correspondent. And it was like, my flight left at like Friday at four. And they were like, she can see you Friday at like 1230. And if you guys know New York, that's like cutting it pretty close for mm -hmm. your flight. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I can see her. And I, she had 15 minutes to meet with me. I met with her and, um, I left her. I went, I like went to the Kinko's in the morning. I had printed out some information about our salary project and I left it with her. And, um, she, and uh, by the way, I barely made it to my flight. Like barely, <laughs> I was sprinting on it, uh, to get there. Um, but I made it, thank God. And, um, then maybe like the Monday or Tuesday later, after that was like on a Friday, she mentioned career contest on the salary project. And we had so many visitors to our site. It broke our site and our developer called me and he was like, what's going on? And I said, like, you can't hack. I was like, no, I wasn't hacked. I was mentioned on uh, good morning America. So that was really, really cool. Um, I had another one where, so the, the final straw when I decided to leave Hulu to um, run Career Contessa is I went to South by Southwest for Hulu and I got to go to one panel and I picked this one on um, female entrepreneurs and they asked everybody, what is your you know, biggest regret? And their biggest regret was that they didn't start earlier. So I went back on Monday and I like quit my job and, um, I gave them like a four month notice. So like between me and them, we had like a slow breakup, but, um, I, every time I had gone to places, I was always luring from Hulu. And so I, I, it was a really hard and sometimes it still is like being not Lauren from Hulu, this big brand name that everyone's heard of. Sometimes it, it's a struggle. And so, um, like from an ego standpoint, I guess, and I got invited to go back to South by Southwest. Um, well, nobody went this year, but in yeah. 2019, uh, as Lauren from Career Contessa, um, I went and did this thing with Goop that, w and they like flew me out and I was like part of this whole like video thing that they did. And I just remember having this very like surreal, like it's been five years since I've been here, but when I was here before her, I was, I was Lauren of, of Hulu and now I get to be Lauren of Career Contessa. And I thought, oh, that's like very full circle. So, you know, I've had, and I, and I've been really lucky. Like I got to speak at Ted women. I got flown to Switzerland to speak at a conference, um, which was just incredible that somebody like, it was kind of like that where they, they were like, yeah, we'll fly you to Switzerland, put you up in this hotel. And we just want you to teach one workshop. I mean, I was like floored that anybody would yeah. do that. So <laughs> yeah, I've had a couple of those and they're, they are surreal. Um, and there's certainly, those are the glitter moments, you know, and the, like the behind the scenes is the glue of every day. You're just inching your way forward in this mud. <laughs> it's <quicksand Yeah>. sometimes. <laughs> 
Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. I love that. I'm in Austin, Texas. So um, I love a good South by shout out. <laughs> um, and that's, I love that. I really, to use your phrase, like that is full circle, but you see and experience like your own growth. Sometimes we're so busy working on our babies, you know, our businesses that we don't even recognize the growth we've been through as individuals and to have it be there as like Lauren from career Contessa, you know, that really, that shows yeah. you everything you've done. I love it. Um, so, okay. Kind of piggybacking off of those, of that question rather. So how did you kind of reach some of those milestones? Like was, was going back to South by a specific target you said like did you want did you know like I want to show up at South by with career Contessa in within five years um or was it more so which I find to be the case so often something happened and it led to something else and you're like I'm kind of hopscotching the success <laughs> oh it's it was it's always that and I think that one of the things that I know is a skill of mine is that I'm a very good relationship builder and I um I talk about this a lot but I kind of have these like two main days a year that I like will also like follow up with my network so I I really enjoy meeting new people I am really good at following up with people and that is, I think, and the reason why I say that and I'm like proud of that skill is because those are the hopscotch moments. It was some woman that I met at a networking event invite or introduced me to an editor at Goop. I went to lunch with her, went on my way to go to lunch with her, stayed in touch with her. Somehow Goop in a meeting mentioned that they needed someone in the career space. She mentioned my name. You know, it's that kind yep. of stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the Good Morning America thing was same idea. It was just totally nuts how I got it. And the fact that she gave me the 15 minutes, it's like, I, I don't actually think she even knew I was like showing up sort of thing. And so I, I feel like most of the time that stuff is built off of seeds you've planted in a lot of other places and other ways. And I think it's, it, there's no like great formula other than like consistency, resilience, grit, um, and like showing up every day and, and, look someday and like I, it's interesting like we are part of a podcast network that's because I got invited to this random lunch I sat next to this woman who told me about them I cold pitched them um they said no and then randomly came back and they were like actually we can take you you know so like mm -hmm. you, you just never know I mean one of my favorite quotes is everything happens for a reason like mm -hmm. there's a reason for the no's there's a reason for the yeses and also the no's don't mean no it's a lot of times they just mean not yet or not today. Oh my gosh. Yes. First of all, it also sounds like you're tenacious AF, which I love. I stand a tenacious lady. <laughs> um, but yes, I completely agree. I think that's something that being in business has really taught me is it's never really a no. It really is just a not yet. And that not yet might be two years down the line. And it might be that you need to hit a certain milestone before it becomes a yes. Like, you know, you might have to put in some work, but people will always circle back if like what you're doing is, um, what am I trying to say? Like if you are building, you know, yeah. like if you build it, they will come. So. Yeah. And I think that, you know, one of the benefits, if anybody on here has a self-funded business is that you have to get creative, you have to get innovative. It's like, how do you get into the rooms? And then when you get into the rooms, it's like, how do you make the most of this room? Because who knows if you'll be in it again? no offense to people who have VC money, that's awesome. But they, they definitely get the glide over some of that because yes. they can pay an amazing PR company who introduces them to their 10 other clients that are already, or their VC, you know, will introduce them to people. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, it's just that the, those opportunities are not for everybody. It's not fit for everybody. And also they're not available to everybody. So I, I think to, you know, uh, I do think it's about tenacity, but I also feel like it's about, um, being creative and innovative and, and being like, you know, I'd say this a lot when I'm giving career advice too. I'm like, so you applied for a job online. You really want the job. That's it. You just applied online. You didn't go any further. You didn't think about how else can I get their attention? How can I make sure my resume is seen by a real person? Like if you really want something, it's, you can't do it the way it's been done a hundred times before. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I think about how hard I worked 
in my first year of business, I mean, I went to every event. I met every person. I gave out so many business cards. Any conference that I went to, I was the first one up and last one to bed because to use your phrase, I was like, I just don't know when I'll be back here again. Yeah. And I was still side hustling and, you know, doing all of these other things to pay the bills. So anytime I had a moment to work on the business, I was working the business. And yeah. I look back now and I'm like, whew, you have a lot of energy when you're 27. You don't have so much when you're 32. I'm so happy I did that. And I really do think that that laid a lot of the groundwork that I am still working off of today. Um, yeah. So I love that. I love that so much. Okay. Well, those are all my questions. So y'all here, we've got the chat. Um, oh, I got a very lovely little private note but I'm trying to get back to everyone here. So if you have questions, please drop them in the chat um, for Lauren, for me and Lauren, mostly for Lauren. You guys can get at me whenever. <laughs> what would you like to know about Career Contessa, about Lauren, about Lauren's book? Show your book again real quick so oh, people yeah. know again <laughs> what we can look for. Yes. Yeah. Pivot, reboot, and build a career of purpose. I mean, I have a question for everyone here. How many people are working on a business or a side hustle already? Um, and how many people have just kind of like the idea of it? Um, okay, Sita says, you just mentioned age. I'm trying to start a business at 41. How in the world do I find that energy? Lauren, do you have any I would, I would say that though it doesn't it's not about your age it's you're so energized when you're excited to be working like I, I, same thing you're it's not it's not about an age thing it's the fact that you're so excited and energized by what you're working on that you want to put in the extra hours you want you know you want to learn how to code that thing or edit that thing um and it's not that like I mean, I, I think about this even today. I have a lot of energy still with the things I'm doing at Career Contessa because I like what I do. Mm -hmm. Work is work. That doesn't mean there aren't parts of, you know, the job that I'm like, and oh, I have to do this again, or I would love to just give this to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't think it's an age thing. I definitely think it's, it's what you're doing thing. Uh, and so, um, yeah, someone said, I would like to start a side hustle or business, have some ideas, scared to start. I mean, my advice with that, and I'm sure you're Kara, you have advice too, is like, just start somewhere, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, I think there's a lot of pressure on everybody to not just have a hobby, but to monetize that hobby too. Like, you know, it's not, everything has to be a side hustle. I don't actually even love that phrase, you know, because I feel like it can so quickly like lose the the good intention it had. But something I would also argue is like, if you don't know where to start, but you have an idea of something you want to do, just start doing that thing. And don't put pressure on yourself to like monetize it. I feel like today when you ask people like, what do they do? It's almost like this pressure to not only have this like amazing answer of where you, what you do and all the money you make doing it, like you're a VP or whatever. Um, but also there's this pressure to be like, and I also do this other thing, this side hustle that makes me a lot of money. And like, you guys, can we give that up? It's not sustainable. <laughs> it's not even healthy. <laughs> oh my gosh. I am with you 100%. Um, yeah, I would definitely say if you're feeling fear, you know, pick one place to start. And that can be, I'm going to get my website up, or it can be, I'm going to get all the social media handles, or it's, I'm going to learn how to use Google analytics, you know, whatever, pick one place, complete one task. Don't overwhelm yourself trying to do everything <laughs> in, yeah. the, in one hour. Cause you're, you're going to lose, you're going to burn out really quickly and you're going to find yourself rather than what you were saying, Lauren, of like finding the joy and the passion and being fired up about it. You're going to see it as like a burden and you're going to feel weighed down by it. So find one thing, check it off the list, find another thing, check it off the list. And yeah. then all of a sudden you've done 15 things. I would also say like, people say this a lot, but like pick one medium and like one niche. So like when I first started, all I had, not all, that sounds bad, but like I had a website and we only did interviews mm -hmm. and then I slowly expanded, you know? So if you want Instagram and your website, you feel like you can handle those two things, um, go for it, you know? So I, I don't think that people need to be everywhere right when they start either. Yeah, I, I still do that. <laughs> I yeah. still do that myself. I'm not everywhere just yet. I just got on Facebook group, you know, this year. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, someone said, so RD says, how did you figure out the legal aspects of your business? How to incorporate? What kind of structure to choose? Taxes? Did you hire attorneys? 
slash accountants right away. Yeah. So <laughs> I did. Cause I was like, I don't know how to do that. The idea of figuring out taxes seemed like, and so also here's another thing. I did a lot of the kind of like not fun, pretty things while I still had a job so I could finance them. So before I left Hulu, I had a website built and I worked with this firm to help me build a site on WordPress. And, and they were located on the first floor of the building that we worked in. So I would go there at like lunch or after work or something. Um, so I built my website and I hired a lawyer and I asked people around for like, a, um, uh, basically like I don't know what they call them, but like, I call her the finance manager now. And she kind of mm -hmm. helps to make sure like, and, and really she just helps me manage everything in QuickBooks to make sure like I, I sort things correctly. Um, so, and the way I asked around for those, I asked other small business owners, like, Hey, do you have a lawyer you can recommend? You have a um, mm -hmm. payroll or a tax person that you can run a book? Basically they're usually called bookkeepers. Um, it, it, so I did that and I paid the upfront cost to have those things going. And then I also made sure that I had, um, nine months of living expenses and everything ready to go. Yeah. And then, and then when I left, I was still like taking on side jobs here and there just as like cat, like play cash, like cash mm -hmm. that I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to do something fun. The other thing I will say is like, when I start, first started running career contested, the other thing I did is I cut out anything I didn't have to have. Like I haven't gone to a, like a fancy workout class in five years. Like, you know, you can run on the pavement for free. I think coronavirus is helping teach everybody, but like, there were a lot of like things I had in my last life that I just didn't get to have anymore. And honestly, I don't miss them either. So that's also just sort of as like a make, you can make your money last longer like that too. Oh my gosh. I love that. My like finance nerd heart is so proud of you. Nine months. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. Um, yeah. I just want to echo, like I did hire an attorney to do my contracts and I literally brought a shoe box. And I, again, I'm the money nerd. This is a little embarrassing, but I brought a shoe box full of receipts to my accountant <laughs> my first year. And I was like, please help me. So yeah. I do think it's very intimidating to hire, especially a lawyer or an accountant because they can get expensive. And if you're self-funding, you're like, oh my God, you know, $3,000 for between the two of them, that's all my startup capital. But it is so worth it because if you get in trouble with the tax man or the lawman, that can shut down your business in a very Yeah, it's really way. expensive. So yeah, go. It's, it's so worth the investment, I would say. <laughs> so, okay. Drew says, what advice do you have for those looking to find a good paying job during COVID survival mode here? Yeah. So if you're in survival mode, AKA you need a job ASAP, I would recommend go where there is demand. So go straight to the companies that you know are hiring. Ideally somebody who maybe is offering benefits. So for example, we know that Amazon is hiring, right? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if they're, if they offer benefits, but like, you know, take a job that you don't love, but gives you a decent salary, decent benefits. That's, that's survival mode. Uh, we all have had to do that, or maybe not all of us, but I know I, I had to do that in a recession. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Every job you have, you learn something from it, even if it's just that this is not what I want to do. Um, and then what you can do is you can spend your time, mornings, nights, weekends, whatever, um, since you need a job right away, and you can spend your extra free time being more specific about what kind of role do I want to work at or work in? What company do I want to work at? And you can really, because finding a good high paying job right away is like the, 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 those things very rarely like go together. And so like most of the time, um, to find a job that you really enjoy, that pays you well, that's a good fit for you values wise, you're going to need time to do that. You're going to need to network with people at those companies. You're need, going to need to identify those companies. You need to fill your skills gaps. You need to polish your resume in LinkedIn. So you can see why I'm saying like, usually those things don't go together right away. If you want a high paying job and that's the number one most important thing to you, then you could also start researching like high paying jobs. Maybe you need to take, you know, coding classes or something like that. Maybe you need to um, look into an industry that you hadn't thought about before. So I think with that question, it's for me, it's the fact that you're in survival mode. So then I, my brain says, okay, well, survival mode means go to the on-demand jobs that are happening right now. Yeah, I would echo that. I think you know, especially right now, very few companies are like, 
here's a job that pays 100K and all these fabulous benefits when we have an 8% 401k match, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just going to be very hard to find that, whereas it's going to be much easier to kind of get your foot in the door somewhere. And then you can either use that to like what you were saying, build yourself up in that company or pay the bills while you work on your side hustle and your yeah. whatever um, business. Um, okay, we're gonna take maybe two more questions, y'all. So I love this one because this is something that I deal with myself. How do I manage shiny object syndrome? I have a lot of ideas. I struggle to keep up and maintain consistency to actually find success with one. Yeah, so I've been there too. Um, and one of the things that I started implementing is um, I started keeping a work journal. So I keep a work journal that I fill out every week. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so important for me is that every day I write down the three priorities that I need to get done or three things I'm going to focus on. I also think that what happens with the this shiny object syndrome is that you you don't follow through with anything that you're doing. So one, you need to take away the distraction. So when do you find yourself getting really anxious or that like sh shiny syndrome? Is it when you're on Instagram, you're looking at other people's stuff? Is it when you scroll the internet doing certain things? So like pick the one thing you're going to do, um, prioritize it for that week. Every morning, write down the three things that you need to get done in order to help you uh, fulfill that goal. Um, and then you can celebrate with a milestone. So, you know, I like keeping a work journal that helps me kind of keep track of like what I've done, what I need to get done. Um, but for you, I mean, if you want to say in the chat too, like what's one of your ideas, like we could, we could, uh, you know, workshop this right now, but the point being is like, I think that the sign, the shiny object syndrome happens because you get anxious because you start looking at something else or you read something else. And so all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I got to stop what I'm doing right here to go do that. But part of what's keeping you stuck is that you're not following through with anything mm -hmm. enough. Um, and you know, we all are guilty of having analysis paralysis, but I kind of believe that your next move is your best move, not because you know everything about it, but because you're moving forward. So that's, um, oh, so for example, I have a travel blog and also started a self-worth podcast, want to create a course to get a to go along with it as well. Want to wire the bug, et cetera. Also want to create a course on a different platform. Okay. So what I would say is that, um, self-worth and travel, those are like, you know, two separate companies in a way. Like I, I do think it's good to pick one niche. Um, and then you can, you know what, you should read the book content Inc. The guy talks a lot about this, like picking one topic and one medium. So like, okay, you have your travel blog and then you have your self-worth podcast. Do you want to keep going with the, the travel direction or do you want to go with self-worth? So let's say you're like, you know what? I, I don't want to keep doing travel, coronavirus, whatever. I, I think that's going to be done for me. I'm really into self-worth. Okay. So now you're going to think about, okay, the blog and the podcast self-worth and start there. Start with consistently blogging, learning about SEO, growing that platform, growing the podcast platform. Cause you know what? I'll tell you as someone who also has courses, if you create a course, like there is no if you build it, they will come with a course. The, the first hurdle of courses is like, you have to build it. And the second hurdle of courses is marketing. So you'd be better off at spending the time being really good at the blogging and the podcast and building up that audience. And then being able to, to make your course that you can then sell to those people who, you know, fall in love with you over time. I mean, people don't fall in love with brands. They fall in love with people and, and it takes some time to get attached. So my advice is that you, one, read Content Inc. where you'll learn about this strategy of like picking one thing and then expanding out as you kind of master that thing. I think that would help. So that's my opinion, of course. I don't know everything that you're doing, but I, again, as someone who has a course and, and this is kind of the thing is like, maybe stop following people who are talking about their six figure course launch and this and that, because the only way you're going to get that too is if you throw a lot of money into Facebook ads. And, and unless you have a huge audience and even if you have a huge, we have a huge audience at Crick and Tesla and we don't monetize our courses like that, you know? So, um, you know, I, 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 I know what it's like, cause I kind of feel like I fell off the deep end with some of that stuff too. And the, one of the best things I did is I was like, okay, I've OD'd on all this like course stuff and, and it's not serving me. And I just had to like cold Turkey stop listening to that. No, no more of those people who are talking about that. Oh my gosh. Like there's a lot you can do just with blogging, like SEO, you know, thinking about how to optimize your blog for mobile, like the, the, you know, what type of topics, if you're going to do self-worth, what are all the topics within self-worth, um, et cetera. 
Yeah, I man, whew, feel so many things that you just said. And I would just echo, at some point, you do have to stop consuming other people's things so you can create your own. Because you also can, we find ourselves, you're absorbing stuff and then you forget maybe to credit. Like I know a lot of people have gotten in trouble with that. Um, I also yeah. think, again, going back to what we were talking about earlier with revenue versus profit, you know, what is kind of your goal there? Are you hoping to be profitable in six months, three months, a year? Like what yeah. kind of personal runway do you have? And exactly what Lauren said, of uh, building that audience and making sure that people are actually there for you. They're connecting to your story, which I think a lot of people who pour a ton of money into Facebook ads, yes, they're building their list or they're building their Instagram following, but those people don't actually care, which means it's going to be really hard to convert them into a paying customer. A dirty little secret yeah, is yeah. that most social media or Instagram in particular, which is like everyone's obsessed with, right? You know, if you have a 2% engagement rate, if you have a 3% engagement rate, you're doing pretty good. Like a lot of people have way less than that, which means if you have a following of even 10,000, but only one person has bought something from you, how successful is your business from a financial point of view, you know? Yeah. So I think that's kind of a lot that we're hitting you with, but really sit down and kind no, of know these things. <laughs> I think it's important though, because I feel like a lot of people, I mean, like she's giving us a specific example, which is why we're able to go off of it. But I also think that there's two things. Uh, my friend, Maxie McCoy, who wrote the book, You're Not Lost. She tells me this all the time. She goes, race horses race with blinders on because they can't, it's not good for them. Like they they don't win if they're able to see what other people are doing. So I always remember that. I'm like, yeah, race horses don't do that. But also if you're not going to spend five years talking about something, don't spend five minutes. So you said that mm -hmm. your travel blog is your baby. Do you want to talk about that for the next five years? If you do, then keep the travel blog. But I, and it's like, look, that's also like, it's okay for interest to, to change and grow. But, um, that was another piece of advice I got from somebody once who they said like, don't spend five minutes on it if you won't spend five years doing it. And self worth and, and travel, all that stuff. Maybe you can find a way to put that under an umbrella that works together. But anyway, I think we're, we're we've gotten to the point, but I, I do think following other people and seeing what they're doing, um, and hearing about their success. I just, I just kind of like want to put this out there. Like, people are always going to be sharing the highlight reel. They're not going to be sharing the real story. And again, like sometimes it's better to just unsubscribe, unsubscribe from the narratives that are not serving you. Yes. Oh, put that on a t-shirt, put that on an Instagram. <laughs> yes. um, okay. We're going to take one more. And I think this is a good one to end on because um, it's short and sweet. So Yuki asks for a super small business, what paid marketing would you recommend if any? Well, I've never done paid marketing, so I guess I'm not a good example. What I, what I am probably would tell you to focus on more is where do you get the most bang for your buck? So, uh, and, and part of the way to answer that is you have to know your data well enough uh, to even to know like, okay, when I put something on Instagram, do I get people to engage? Like, what is your goal? Like, at, for me at Career Contessa, our goal is we want to be able to sell our own products and services. And then the other goals, we want to be able to get page views on something because that is also how we make money. Right. So, I mean, the reality is, is uh, you're running a business, um, and not a hobby. You do have to care about money and like where it's coming from. So it's like knowing your data well enough to be able to say like, okay, when we send an email out, it's worth this much. So we should really prioritize growing our email list. So I'm just using career contestants as an example. We know that our email list is our number one tool that helps us, whatever it is that we're trying to do, whether we want you to sign up for something, we want you to look at some page views of something or like look at an article or something, or we want you to buy something. So we bring everything back to the mother load, which is email, email, email. So Instagram, how does that get us to email? How does this get to email? How does this get to email? So for me, I don't pay for marketing, but I'm very super specific about trying to have all roads lead back to email. Um, and it's not that I'm anti paid marketing, but I look at the conversion rate. So like our you know, pop up for our home page, pop up on our, on our home page, the pop up to join our email list, it has a 4% conversion rate. So I focus on those things. I focus on getting like my house in order first. Once my house is in order, if I'm open to paid marketing, I, I would maybe do it. But the other thing I would say is like, we've done a lot of marketing collaborations and swaps where like newsletter swaps, um, uh, 
you know, collaborating in other ways that help us with our goal, which is email. So for me, I wouldn't do paid marketing. This is just my opinion. I wouldn't do paid marketing until I've tapped out all those other um, sources first. 100% echo that. I've also never done paid marketing. And I think if you're a very small business, you don't need it. There's so much free stuff, really exhaust the free stuff first before you get anywhere near a marketing budget. (laughs) Yeah. And like, be really clear about like, so people will run Facebook ads to have people buy their course, but like, that's not how that always works. Like if you were going to run a Facebook ad, you would want to be really specific about what you want, what action you want people to take, because you can end up paying more like the cost per acquisition. You can end up paying more than what you actually make. Yes. So you have to be careful with that. Totally. Great. Well, wow. I feel like we all just got a master class in some business stuff. I'm like, I learned stuff. I'm over here frantically taking notes. I'm like, yeah. That's <laughs> so, Lauren, thank you so much for being here. I am just, I'm thrilled. I think this went super well. Um, everyone else, please. I put uh, the Career Contessa website at the beginning of this chat, um, but we'll be sending out this recording as well as a bunch of links. Um, and if you're looking for more power moves, we've got this book. It's called Power Moves. So <laughs> go ahead, get you this. Um, you know, order it from your local independent or your Amazon, whatever you got to do. Um, thank you again so much for being here, Lauren. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone.